Runners Radio is brought to you by runners.com and the Runners Red Zone. It's the only running coaching platform you will ever need. There's no thinking, no planning. We do all of that. Just put us in your ears and away you go. 45-minute quality running sessions, strength and conditioning for anyone, yoga, and much, much more. If you're wanting to take minutes off your PB, run a marathon, or just beginning your running journey, then head on over to runners.com, that's R-U-N-N-E-Z.com, and get started. Rightio, let's get on to the show. G'day and welcome to Runners Radio. Today on the show, one of the running world's leading coaches and one of the major influences on my own coaching philosophies over the last 15 or so years. Since 1989, Coach Swartz has trained a multitude of state champions, national champions, Olympic trials qualifiers, world team qualifiers and world champion champions. He's a level five IFF coach with multiple degrees and he's now completing his PhD in health and human performance. His training philosophy can be explained in one phrase. Keep the ball rolling. A true student of the sport, I welcome Tom, the Tin Man Swartz. Welcome, Coach. Thank you. Appreciate it, Coach. Uh, hope all is well there, there in Australia. We're, yeah, we're going well. Thank you, buddy. We're um, we've just not to date this episode too much, but we're we're pretty good. We've come out of lockdown pretty well, so we're um, yeah, we we seem to be ticking along. Fingers crossed. But yeah, don't want to touch wood while I say that. If I, I obviously introduced you quite um significantly there but look for the listeners that don't know tin man I, I implore you to do some reading because it's not hard to find a lot on this on this great man he's one of the the great brains of the sport and just and the big reason for that is he just continues to learn and just he's never never ever stops learning but he's also very generous with the information and and his research and 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 everything that he's he's learned along the way and he puts it out there for for coaches like myself and other coaches all around the world so I guess, I guess to summarise, mate, take take the listens through where you are right now. Then we'll take them right back to the beginning. And I know I, I love the way you, you began, and then then we'll get onto the philosophies, the methodology, the science, and and life in general. So, what are you doing currently as we speak to you this morning? Um, well, I'm getting my guys uh, ready for a big track meet in California, um, where elite competitors are only are are um, involved, and uh, it'll be an opportunity for some of the uh, American guys to hit the United States standard, get into the US, United States Olympic trials, which take place uh, at the end of next June. Also, it's a, an opportunity for some of the individuals uh, to hit the uh, Olympic games qualifying standards, which are um, rather difficult. And uh, hopefully we get good weather, good situation so that, uh, you know, we get a few people that can hit those standards. That's what I'm up to at the moment, other than uh, collecting data for my doctoral dissertation. Um, I've gone through all my academics, finished them, I think it was in July of last year, took my exams, uh, passed them, and I've been working on uh, uh, creating a proposal for my research study, throwing it all away once COVID hit after working on it for four months because I couldn't do it because they weren't going to allow me to test individuals inside of a lab on a treadmill and start it all over. Um, and now I am doing data collection, um, outdoor running tests, a 1600 meter test and a 400 meter test. And um, when my dissertation is done, you kind of understand how it all fits together and why I'm doing those two tests rather than a single test. It has to do with establishing the underlying physiological um, components for each individual rather than using one data point. Um, the two tests will explain uh, the aerobic and anaerobic differentials, speed differentials, um, and it will make it possible for coaches like you, good coaches like you who want to make uh, exercise prescription, prescription exact for individuals more possible. Um, at least that's my goal. Yeah, and I can't wait. So if you if you take us back, so the PhD, I know we're getting the cart before the horse in, in a minute, but just, just the listeners, once you've got your PhD completed, what's the goal with that? Well, 
you know, uh, I think I'm going to end up probably teaching a few courses online. Mm. I've had a couple university department ex of exercise science chairs uh, tell me they're interested in hiring me. Um, I don't want it to disrupt my own coaching yeah. business and, and taking care of my athletes nor my family. Um, but I'm going to look at my options that way. Um, if I were a younger man and unmarried, I'd probably go straight into the university, be a research scientist, combined with a um, in in classroom, prof you know, instructor. That's yeah. what I would do. That's I passed on that opportunity 30 years ago, um, and it, for many years I regretted having passed on the opportunity and went a different direction. But I ended up finding my wife and. Now I was uh, a 13 year old son and I guess I don't regret it one bit. It took me a different direction, but I, uh, that's what life is all about. You know, sometimes the unexpected can be good for you. Absolutely. And I now think I'm in a better place than I was a long time ago. I've got a lot more experience in life. I can interpret information a lot better based on my experiences. So when I read science research as an example, I can piece it together with more than 30 years of, of coaching experience now. Um, had I done that, had I gone straight into uh, academic uh, work, uh, academia a long time ago, um, it might have taken me a long time to get to the point where I could have sufficient background knowledge to be able to identify nuances, permutations of science in a way that is pragmatic, that is practical. I think uh, doing it the, the direction that I went, actually now in retrospect is way better. I have lots of experience on the, on the ground, so to speak. Now I can add on even more science to explain what I've, what I've witnessed, what I've observed, what I always thought was true, but um, needed time to ferret out what was true and what was not. Try this method, try that method, borrow from this method, borrow from that method, refine, 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 refine. You know, when you're trying to grow and learn, um, the hunger never stops inside of you, the drive. It's, it's, it's like the drive of an athlete. You know, I, I attribute a lot of my growth to that um, drive that I learned as an athlete. I wanted to always be better than I was you know, yesterday or the week before or one season to the next. And uh, when I ran up against walls, um, rather than, you know, cave in as an athlete, I just either tried to barrel through the wall or at least tried to find a way to climb over it or around it. Uh, never stop, never stop, never stop. Um, that hunger to be successful as an athlete is is something that I still have as an as as an academic, as an as a coach too. Uh, I think you probably can relate to this. You know, you want to you want to be you want to be better than you were last year, so that you can help your athletes even more. I can. It's brilliantly put, and a great metaphor for life, really. But it's it's so true with the the continued learnings and always always digging and always never ever stop being curious. And and you're one of the best at it, and you're also one of the best at articulating it for all levels of athlete and coach, um, which is a credit to you. And I guess the university world would be um, privileged to have someone of your applied nature of over 30 years of applying it face to face, which is um, like you said, it's that's, that's half the battle in academia. There's, there's not as many people that with the applied background that you might have, but I guess talking of academia and where it all began, um, take us back, take us back mate to your high school days and, um, I think there was a couple of pretty influential figures in there. Uh, I think it was a, a Mr. Hine, was it, in high school? And and a couple of these these kind of, I guess, leaders in, in your life and where it all began, your coaching, uh, your, your search for knowledge and, and quest for endurance knowledge. Um, and then, yeah, just, I guess, grow us through the 80s and, and when, I guess, you stuck, got stuck into full-time coaching. Yeah. I might even go slightly farther back than high school. Go. Okay. Um. You know, I started in sports already in second grade, and I was uh, very into baseball and basketball and football, uh, traditional American sports. And I was already growing very interested in how coaches got the best out of their athletes, whether it was 
training them really hard or teaching them strategies or giving them rate game simulations, that sort of thing. And then uh, when I joined middle school or junior high school, um, cross country and then track, I was in seventh and eighth grade, which means I was between, thir- you know, roughly 12 or 13 when I started and 14 when I finished. I was privileged to have uh, a coach that um, opened my eyes about thinking outside of the box. And um, Mr. McMorris, who has now since gone on to heaven, is was the man to tell me, you have a lot more than just running ability, Tom. He said, you're a great runner and you're one of the best I ever had, but what you have is an endless curiosity to understand why, um, why we're doing something, how we can do, and also how we can do it better. And so he encouraged me all the time to um, uh, question traditional methods. He was in fact himself that way. He had been an extremely good runner in the early, in the late fifties into the early sixties. And uh, he was questioning the methods that were being used, which back then, prior to Lydia being well known, was constant interval work. Every single day, they ran intervals, hard intervals. Um, he said he ran, you know, probably 10,000 repeat 400s, you know, by the time he was uh, 18 years old. And, um, or quarter miles, because it wasn't 400s, but. So he was the first one to get got me uh, got me going on the idea of of being open to new ideas and feeling feeling like it was okay to ask questions um, about why we were doing stuff. And then I I had the privilege of being able to continue to know him in high school because he was a high school guidance counselor. So I'd pop into his office probably once, sometimes twice a week. Sometimes to say hi and other times just run ideas by him. And much like Mr. Hine, who was my advanced biology events physiology teacher in high school, he'd say, well, what do you think? You know, rather than just tell me straight out what he, what he thought was an answer. Both of those guys would say, yeah, that sounds really interesting. Let's go with it. All right, explain to me. And then they were always doing the what if. What if everything we know is not true? What if only part of what we know is true? What if part of what we know is only true true in certain situations or for certain individuals or for certain backgrounds? Because the method that may be used by, uh, say, the high school track team might be really fine for the kid who's been in the sport for three or four years already. But is it really the best method for the kid who's novice? So anyway, that's, that's, that's my uh, middle school, high school background. And then uh, college, I, 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 I had a ran, ran into two great coaches. My first one was at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. Um, Bill Cornell was the head coach there. He had been a world-class miler, half miler back in the early 60s, NCAA champ in the half mile, second in the mile. Um, in fact, he held the world record for juniors at one time in the mile when he's from England. And uh, hard-nosed, you know, hardcore type of guy. And he just, I go into his office and he's like, you think you do damn much? He goes, get out there and run a fast 10 miners because if you can't do a fast 10 miler and all that interval work in the world, doesn't mean anything. Well, he would use some expletives, but you know what I'm saying? And then, uh, then I went on to uh, Southern, or I went transferred from Southern Illinois University to um, University of Wisconsin La Crosse, a smaller university, but it had an extraordinary program. uh, So good, in fact, they beat up on a lot of division one programs. University of Wisconsin system was pretty exceptional. They were at least two, if not three universities that had a lot of athletes on there that really were capable of running at our division one level. Um, but they came from small schools. Um, they didn't play or, or they didn't uh, run year round. Um, there are harsh winters there. So uh, they were well underdeveloped by the time they went on to the university level. And so they, they physically had the ability, they had the mental drive, they had commitment to excellence, but 
they had, had not hit those high standards of uh, performance at times by the time they were 18, so they didn't get the university scholarships. So they were on our program, in our program, and by the time they were 19, 20 years old, they were very often on par with or ahead of a lot of Division I athletes. And it was great. And I had a, um, a professor there who was our coach. He taught exercise physiology. He also taught um, physical education, pedagogy. And uh, he was the first one to really say, why don't you help write training programs? Why don't, why don't you use some of that curiosity and some of that ambition and just do something with it? You go, write programs coming in come into my office and I'll take a look at them. If it looks tenable, we'll do it. He goes, I don't care how young you are. You know more. He's like, I was 18, 19 years old, probably maybe the first time he said that. He goes, you know more than the vast majority of people I know that have a PhD in exercise phys. He goes, you know more than me about it. I go, oh, that's not true. He's like, well, he goes, you certainly know more of the new stuff than I do. I know the old stuff better than you do, but you know the new stuff. He goes, where do you learn all that? He goes, I said, well, I could actually be a better student as an undergrad here, but I, I spend all my time in the library whenever I can, when I'm not working on my other academics, I'll, they have to kick me out of the library. You know, at midnight, they kick me out because I'm going through all the research journals. He goes, well, keep doing it. Keep doing it. So he did let me give uh, my two cents worth into how we train the athletes. And he modified the programs based on what I was saying. So Dr. Phil Leston was a big influence on my life. And then the last one in college or university, we say college over here a lot, but um, rather than university, but was Dr. William Floyd. He was the uh, head professor of exercise physiology at our university. And uh, he liked my ideas so much that during his lectures to the undergrads, and we'd have maybe 250 kids in the uh, auditorium, he'd, he'd say, what do you think, Tom? And I'm like, yeah, well, that's only partially true because those anaerobic and aerobic percentages are wrong. And he goes, rather than telling me I was an idiot or telling me that I have no reason to challenge any of those well-established you know, um, professors or research scientists from the past, he'd say, explain to us why you think they're wrong. And I would go into a long lecture for probably 20 minutes. I'd say, look, this is how they tested people. This was the theory, but this is the flaw in their theory. And I guarantee you that it's 50% more aerobic for all of these events than what they're saying. For example, in 19, uh, say 85, 86, they were saying 50% of a one mile run is anaerobic. I said, that's not true. Guarantee it's not true. And I gave four different reasons why. And uh, we know since about 1998 or 99, since Paul Gaston did his research, that in fact, it's between 75 and 84% aerobic for a typical one mile run that's, that lasts approximately four minutes. And then the other, and then the other thing I said right away in, in, in Dr. Floyd's classes is, why are we saying, why are we identifying a distance? He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, well, is the aerobic anaerobic percentage the same for somebody who runs four minutes or the, somebody who's slow and runs eight minutes? He goes, oh, I never thought of that. He already say that like a 10K is 90% aerobic is the, is, it, that definitely show, and the 10K takes much longer in time to complete. It's got to be logical, therefore, that as time goes on, right, the amount of aerobic increases. So, therefore, a mile is not a mile. It is, you have to qualify it. A mile in four minutes might be X, Y, Z percent. Another mile that's slower will be a lower percent anaerobic and a higher percent aerobic. What if you had Jane, who is a secretary that never ran in life, she's 50 years old, and she gets, starts jogging and you lose weight and she's feeling good and she runs a mile in 12 minutes. And she's still 50% anaerobic. <laughs> He's like, good point. I said, yeah, she's probably like 95% aerobic. Yeah, 
just to interrupt you, man, this is I, I've, I love this, and I was always curious about this as a youngster. How old were you? So you're 19, 20 years of age and presenting this mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah. That's amazing, and especially back in those yeah, times. Yeah, well, you know, I'd art. Yeah, Rick. Well, you know, the thing is, I was already writing about this in high school. So mm. when I was a junior in high school, 1983, and uh, I had an advanced physiology course with Mr. Hine, um, we had to do a, uh, a, a project, you know, you had to do a rather extensive paper uh, to turn in. And I did mine on the aerobic anaerobic percentages. And I, I can't remember the exact title, but it was something to the effect uh Research scientists are wrong. It, it we are run. We are more aerobic than anaerobic for most events. That was kind of like my subtitle, but it had a more concise title. And basically, I went down through all the possibilities. I'm like, look, you know, uh, the methodology is is based. Everything I can understand about it at the time was they were testing people uh, on the treadmill, measuring how much oxygen was consumed during the say, for example, one mile run. And then how much oxygen they were consuming post-exercise until the person got back down to their normal resting value. Mm -hmm. And let's say the individual consumed 20 liters of oxygen, pure oxygen, during the four-minute mile run. Say it was a world-class runner. Okay, five liters per minute, which is very doable for a world-class athlete. Okay. And then they continue to have the apparatus, the pulmonary gas analyzing machine apparatus on their face. And they basically stay hanging onto the rails or even if they put a chair onto the treadmill and sitting still and they sit there and they keep breathing hard for a while and gradually not breathing quite as hard. And they continue to breathe above normal resting rate until at some point, an hour from now, an hour post-exercise, they're back to resting. Then, and let's say it took 20 liters of oxygen above resting value in the post-exercise. So their assumption was it really cost 40 liters of oxygen Mm. to run that four minute mile. 20 was, 20 of it though was the deficit or debt. Debt is the payback, deficit is occurring ongoing. So they said 50-50. Right, 50% aerobic, 50% anaerobic because the payback shows you how much you really need it. And I asked this question right away. I'm like, oh, what if you're hot? I said, when I would get on the tractor and we were farming and it was hot and hot and humid outside, I'm not really exercising very hard. I'm just driving on the tractor, but I'm sweating and my heart rate's like 110 beats, right? Double of what it is when I'm, you know, when I'm resting. Uh, my breathing, my respiration rate is a little more deep and a little more often in this hot, humid weather. And even though I'm minimally exercising, like just turning the steering wheel, okay, you're telling me that, um, you know, I probably am going anaerobic or something or whatever. I'm like, okay, what if, what if body temperature has a lot to do with how much oxygen was being consumed post-exercise to try to cool off the body to get back to normal resting state? Right. And then I said, you know, when I go in the run in the neighborhood, right, I go out and ran in the countryside when dogs chase me. I'm running for my life because I don't want them to bite me. Adrenaline is flowing through my body like you wouldn't believe. And when I get away, finally get away from them, it's like several minutes before my my heart is not like racing really rapidly. I'm like at maximum heart rate, 200 beats a minute. Prior to that, I was 150 beats a minute when I was running easy through the countryside. Mm -hmm. That adrenaline kicked me up to 200 in a really quick, like 20 seconds or something. Okay, so what if stress hormones, adrenaline, and so on are part of the reason why you're consuming so much oxygen after you're done exercising and running that four-minute mile? See what I'm saying? Really put, yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And hence, thought the and the time being arbitrary. Sorry, the kilometers and miles being arbitrary as well. It's it's time under tension yeah. as well, which for a young time under tension. Well said. You like that one? Yeah, I, man. I like that. Thanks, buddy. I'm not sure. I've used that for a long time, but we we do use a lot of, of minutes. A very look, like, yeah. But I'm I've just picked up different stuff, like like obviously over the journey of the last couple of decades. But t- time is king because your body knows no miles and doesn't know kilometers either. Right. So, um, but that's yeah. I'll let you explain that far more detail than me because tell me about the so the late eighties. You start take me through to the late eighties when you start coaching 
um, in your own right. And then I guess uh, you, you're well known for many, many things. And then we can take us into some of your philosophies. Phys- um, I guess the critical philosophy is a big one, but we'll, we'll get to that. Just take us through the late eighties and the and early nineties and where you end up there. Well, while I was still an undergraduate working on my four year degree, um, Dr. Eston said, Hey, um, why don't you, uh, why don't you sign up for an independent project? And uh, you can run, you can take over the steeplechasers and you coach the steeplechasers. You report to me every week, uh, show me the workouts you're going to assign for them. Explain to me why you're going to do it. Write it out, you know, in a paper, two pages. He would say, give me two pages, you know, and then, um, and then you write out a final report when the, when the semester's over and uh, you should include everything from who are the subject. He basically set me up for a dissertation. I didn't know it. He, he was like, who are the participants? Who are the subjects? What are their demographics? You know, what are their ages? What are their backgrounds? Yada, yada. All that stuff matters when you're trying to interpret results, he said. And I go, yep, absolutely agree. And he goes, uh, identify their their beginning and end point. So if uh, the guy was a nine minute, 40 second steeplechaser and at the end, you know, on uh, March 1st and on May 15th, he's a 9-11 steeplechaser. Okay, that's a progression, do percent progressions. Identify what he's good at and what he's not good at by the end of the season in comparison to what he's, where he started. So that was kind of my first experience. I was a senior in college, my fourth year. And, and uh, so started coaching the steeplechasers and we ended up uh, doing really well at our conference competition. That conference is where the universities in your conference compete for a championship. <clears throat> and uh, my guys got first, third and eighth. And they beat out some guys that were multi All-Americans. All-American is kind of a prestigious right. honor, you know. And so uh, it was pretty exciting. It was pretty exciting for me. And then I started grad school immediately. Um, that was 1989 and uh, became an assistant coach for Coach Eston during cross country. And then I coached indoor track and then uh, I coached the women as well. So then I got into regular coaching thereafter. Coached at a small university called Concordia River Forest. It's actually now called Concordia Chicago. And that's where I'm getting my PhD. Actually, That's a nice bit of synergy. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. So the early nineties, um, you're, you're obviously, cut, you, you're very much in the research field already. You're just always, always curious, always reading. So you're studying and coaching, and I guess where does where does it start to evolve through the mid nineties? And did you have stuff set in stone already then, like as a philosophy type setup? I sure did. I had already formed some of my ideas about optimal training um, from the early eighties, actually, when I had more success than I had in the late eighties, early nineties. So in the early eighties, I was running road races all summer. Ten sure. uh, k road races were the were the common distance. Uh, there weren't any 5K road races, no such thing. Once in a while, a five mile race. And uh, in the summer, I kept it really simple. I did distance work. I raced a 10K on the weekend and um, I would do one workout during the week, an easy version of a 10K race, like maybe four times a mile at 10K or, you know, something like that three quarter mile repeats, half mile repeats, uh, fartlek versions of it. And I noticed that anytime I tried to run much faster than uh, 10K pace in training, I couldn't race very well that weekend. My legs would be powerful, but my, my endurance would suck. I literally would get out there 10 minutes into the race and be breathing crazy hard and my pace would slow down and it was very frustrating. So I learned that faster is not better. Faster is not better. What I also learned was that for some reason, 10K training for me and 10K racing made me fit for every distance. So that by the end of the summer, I would jump in a one mile race, um, particularly if our um, high school coach would have a time trial and I'd crush it. I haven't been doing any 10K training. I mean, any mile training at all. 
just been getting fitter and fitter and fitter aerobically and stronger from 10K training. And my 10K times, you know, started in uh, maybe the 36, 30 range when I was 14 and ended up in the 32, 50 range, 32, 45 on hilly courses by the time I was, say, 17 or something like that. Great, so I was getting this theory that if the pace you can hold for about 30 to 35 minutes seems to be a sweet spot because you can get strong beyond belief. You can build your endurance so good from it that you can go out without even doing really long runs and go out and do a 12 miler, 14 miler, two or three times I would do that. I normally didn't go past eight miles, but a friend would call up who was lived in the northern uh, a town north of me and say, hey, you want to go for a run? I'm like, yeah, sure. We meet at some location and he was used to doing long runs. I wasn't. I was not going beyond eight. And we go out there and run like 12 or 13 miles at a quick pace. I'm like, I feel great. I don't even feel tired. And we're cr- cranking off a pace. He's like, man, you're, you're sandbagging me. You know what do you mean? He's like, you run on mega mileage because there's no way you should be able to run this like 13 miles as fast and it looked like you're effortless. I'm like, dude, I'm never going past eight miles in training on my own. But I didn't tell him I did a lot of CV 10 K type training, you know, basically twice a week. And uh, so that was my philosophy. My philosophy was forming there, but then I got into, you know, um, into the college level and I just, I did what I was told and I pretty much hammered the workouts and tried to keep up. And all of it did was destroy me. It just destroyed me. I got compartment syndrome and had to have surgery. I was anemic quite a bit. In fact, my first year in college, I was a wa- I was walking ball of fatigue. My, I, my, my hemoglobin level was insanely low. It was like 50% below normal. Um, you wonder how that must be so common as well with the- I think so. The rubbish I mentality of, um, of no pain, no gain mentality still still probably prevalent, <laughs> especially at the college- NCAA level, unfortunately, um, which which is something that good coaches uh, like yourself have tried to change for the last 30 years. Um, yeah. in, intelligent, smart work. And there's a time and a place to be to be ruthless and go to the well. But um, yeah, there's no point going to the well if you if you can't train three days later. So um, there's definitely a time and a place. You mentioned CV. Um, I'm a massive, massive proponent. And I love it. Um, go as in-depth as you want about this, and then we'll continue to carry on your chronological journey. Um, I guess for the listeners that are, are very um, aware of you, that know about it, but I still think a lot of people don't understand it properly and don't understand the way to, I guess, um, structure it into their to their monthly cycles. And, and like you said, it works. It works for 400 meter runners right up to the ultra marathon guys, which, which is fascinating, but it makes sense when you've given it that background of your physiological background, what you've already spoken about earlier. So take us through CV, uh, how it developed over the years. And, and I guess the true definition, which is really important Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Critical velocity was originally called critical value because I was taking graduate level statistics at the time and critical value is a particular way of identifying whether something is um, significant or not. So when I was a grad assistant, uh, I was a graduate student and graduate assistant in 1989 through 91 in exercise science. Human performance is what it was called, but it's the same thing as exercise science. Um, I was asking the question, can I, can, I, can I quantify specifically in mathematical terms what critical velocity is? I know what it is in terms of how it feels, it's harder than threshold, but it's not as hard for me as 5K, okay? It is, um, it's a, it's, it makes my respiration rate at this level, but not at this level. So I was rating everything on scales that I created. I created scales for myself and for my athletes, a scale of one to five. I used it all the time. Very easy, easy, moderate, hard, and very hard was my five scale. And I use this five scale for... <clears throat> all kinds of different ways of identifying whether something was very easy all the way up to very difficult. I'd ask my athletes the same thing, you know, how does this feel? And they'd say, well, this threshold that we're supposed to be, that feels too slow, coach. What does it feel? That feels like a three to me. I'm like, okay. And uh, how long do you think you could hold this? I'm like, long time, coach. 
are you sure this is? I'm like, yeah, but they're telling us this is what you're supposed to run. I'm like, why don't we try this? Try running about 10 seconds a mile faster than threshold. Because I was secretly thinking, that's about what I did in my own training. And I found it very effective. So they would run reps like meet repeat miles or 1200 to thousands at CV, 10 seconds faster a mile than threshold roughly. And they'd say, this feels like I'm working at a solid effort, but I'm not getting exhausted. I feel like I could do quite a few of these if I had to. I'm like, cool. And then uh, let's stop. Let's not do too many. And uh, let's do something else like some 200s or some hill repeats or some fast sprints afterwards. Because I think, uh, you know, racing is not about one pace. You got to be able to use, run a bunch of different paces within a race. You got to get off the starting line fast. You got to be able to hold a steady pace fast. You got to be able to surge and break your opponents. You got to have a long kick and a short kick. You got to start way away, far away from the finish line accelerating, right? Particularly if you don't have top end sprint speed. So you got to have a long kick, but you also have to have that hundred last 150 meter kick. Okay. So you have, you use a variety of speeds. So let's do that. In more now, when it comes to quantifying critical velocity, um, basically it is equivalent to 90% of VO2 max plus or minus a percent. And the lactate level depending upon your training background and the, the uh, fast twitch composition of your legs is in the neighborhood of five to seven millimoles, whereas threshold is typically around three to five millimoles, depending upon if you're a slow twitcher or a fast twitcher, where four is considered normal or average, but that's not necessarily true. You take an 800 meter run and they can have an individual lactate threshold of up, up to seven and a half or eight that's a steady state for them where you take somebody who's an ultra marathon or, or an Alberto cells are back in the day who had 93% slow twitch uh, lactate threshold might be three millimoles that low. It's because fast twitch fibers produce lactate quickly and easily and slow twitch don't. And it's really that simple. But anyway, um, in terms of heart rate, if you wanted to use heart rate, you're talking about four or five beats above the lactate threshold heart rate is where CV would be. It's typically around 92 to 94% of maximum heart rate once you've been doing it for several minutes in a row without break. Um, about 93 and a quarter percent is pretty close to the average plus or minus about one, one and three quarters percent standard deviation. Uh, your breathing rate will feel like you're barely barely keeping it steady. Like it's semi-difficult to hold it at where it is without it getting more advanced where you have to breathe more rapidly or deeper. So it's right at that cusp. And in terms of practicality, most runners who are well-trained, it's a pace they can hold for about 32 minutes plus or minus four. So I usually just say off the top of my head to guys, hey, can you run it for half an hour without stopping? Because if you can't, you're going too fast. Um, so those are a bunch of ways to, uh, to frame critical velocity in, in your head. You know what I'm saying? You've framed it brilliantly. And you've given lots of good examples there. And I think for the listeners um, of this show who, who might be doing a lot of their quality sessions too hard, I think it's a really good uh, look up the Tin Man reach out to them if you need to, but just start looking at different ways to run your, especially you're going to plateau and you're going to be plateauing if, if you listen to this show and doing that kind of stuff. So taking the CV outlook, taking Tim Mann's philosophy is really, really important for a lot of you guys that are already, that are always beaten up or feel like Tim Mann was, uh, the coach was talking earlier about how he just, he was always flat. He was always fatigued. He was in a constant state of fatigue when he was, he was trying to um, beat himself up in those um, NCAA days. Um, that was really well put, um, Coach. Can you can you explain? I guess we're, we're in this now. We're, you can go deep into the weeds. The um, the reason we we're doing this, the the malleable intermediate fast twitch fibers, the what the reason we want to stack these full of mitochondria and the capillarization. Just take the next three or five minutes and just go deep into the weeds for the guys. That I guess give them a bit of understanding of why we're doing this. Um, and then apart from the practicality and the methodology as well. It's important to start with the. Uh, understanding that we basically as humans have three 
major muscle fiber types. And we call it fiber, by the way, physiologists do instead of cells. You can think of it as cells if you are accustomed to regular biology, okay? You've got type one and type two categories. Type one category is what is red oxidative or type or uh, slow twitch. Uh, there are met many methods of identifying the, the fibers. You can do it through staining where you put an agent uh, onto the muscle fiber, and if it stains red, then it's a type one. That's the original way of doing it. Um, it stains if you have certain enzymes within the mitochondria, they turn red. If it turns a pinkish color, they typically are, typically are the type two uh, A intermediate fast fibers. And if you stain them and they're completely white, that's the explosive fibers, okay? And if you wanna call them twitch, which has to do with snipping out a little bit using using a device that really hurts like you would not believe. <laughs> you go in, you snip with a hook and you take out some meat and you can put in under, under uh, in a loading device where you, you, you connect it on both ends and send an electric current into it. And then you graph how high the amplitude of this contraction. And if it, if it goes really, really high, on the graph and very, very rapidly, meaning just a small amount of milliseconds, that's a type 2X explosive fiber, an Usain Bolt type of fiber, okay? So uh, on the other end of the extreme, you have the, the kind that doesn't uh, go up to its peak very fast on the graph. It's kind of shallow and it's about half as high or less that's the type one slow twitch. That's why they call it slow twitch. That kind of fiber is um, an endurance fiber by nature. It has more mitochondria, which are uh, the little organelles that process oxygen that, that uh, you supply from your cardiovascular system. They have uh, more enzymes uh, in those mitochondria to process the oxygen. And by nature, they have more capillaries Okay, think of your postural muscles as all type one slow twitch muscle fibers. They keep you upright for a long period of time. They don't have much power by nature, okay? But they can go forever, right? As long as you have fuel supply there and oxygen supply, you're good to go. Okay, now the cool thing about type one slow twitch fibers, and I, I know this is a long time getting to the CV and the malleable, but you know, it's important to have the foundation. If you train the type one slow twitch fibers with high volume, meaning many minutes or many kilometers or many miles, and you don't run too fast and you don't completely destroy them by going too beyond their capability, right? You gradually build up the volume. You'll transform them into even better aerobic monsters, right? They'll build even more mitochondria, the size of the mitochondria more importantly, right, even more capillaries. But what's really cool, Dr. Trapp from Ball State University about 30 years ago showed, you can increase their strength and power, their velocity of contraction enormously. So when old time runners used to say, I'm trying to build strength, when they were out doing 100 mile weeks or whatever, actually they were. Their, their type one slow twitch muscle fibers were nearly doubling in strength not just endurance. Trap proved that. Okay, and there are a couple others, but Trap was Scott, Dr. Scott Trap, T R A P P E. Okay, he proved that. Now, um, the intermediate fiber, the one that contracts fairly rapidly, not quite as rapidly as, as the explosive fiber, the type two X, and certainly faster or faster than the type ones and has an amplitude somewhere in the middle, that's the one that we're targeting with CV. It's called type 2A or fast twitch intermediate. I started calling it fast twitch intermediate many, many, many years ago. Um, and I even brought that up in the early forums like in 2002 and three right. on letsrun.com, which I now despise because basically you have nothing but a bunch of people just trying to tear apart the sport tear apart anybody that's trying to do good. Um, 
makes me sad. Back in the day, it was full of people that were um, more respectful of each other and shared good ideas. And um, most of them were coaches trying to help other people, you know, other athletes uh, giving back to the sport. But um, anyway, I kind of digress. The type two A fibers can go either direction. They can go the anaerobic, anaerobic direction, meaning the ability to contract without much use of oxygen, or they can go the aerobic direction, meaning the ability to contract the muscle fibers with the use of oxygen that's already present. See, most people think that you go anaerobic because you don't have enough oxygen there. That's not true. Dr. George Brooks from UC Berkeley, long, long time ago in his research showed, no, there's plenty of oxygen available there. It's whether you can use it or not. That's the key, right? If you don't have, if you don't have the ability to get the oxygen into the muscle fiber, think of it as the cell. And if you don't have enough machinery inside of that cell, the mitochondria, you can't use the oxygen. So the real major focus should be developing the machinery, right? The machinery of the fast twitch fiber can be transformed into an aerobic monster instead of by its nature, an anaerobic. I say this all the time when I speak at clinics. Look, by nature, we're designed for our faster immune muscle fibers are designed to help us run for about 45 seconds flat out to get away from the lion that's trying to kill us. Right, because if we notice the lion that's that's 400 meters away, and he get he and they get up, the pride gets up off the ground and wants to chase us, and they're like twice as fast as us. If we turn and run as fast as we can for 45 seconds, they won't eat us because they're all fast twitch X fibers like Usain Bolt, and they can't run for more than 25 seconds flat out, and then they got to lie down for three to five hours. So we turn and run for 45 seconds, we live. That's why we had the faster mini muscle fibers in the first place, I suggest. But here's the beauty. If you dial back the intensity, instead of running at the speed that you can hold for 45 seconds or 40 seconds, you dial it back maybe 10, 15, 20%. You use the same muscle fibers. You contract the same muscle fibers. But now you're telling your muscle fibers, hey, look, uh, no crisis situation here. You might as well start using some of that oxygen. Let's start building some of that machinery. You start building a mitochondria in those fast intermediate muscle fibers. You start building the enzymes and the monocarboxylate transporters in the, in the outside lipid layers that help you transport in and transport out some of the lactate and some of the fuel, right? you got all kinds of machinery that develops. So let's build more capillaries because really what you're telling me is it's we're not running flat out for 45 seconds. We're going to run at a pace maybe we can hold for 30 to 40 or 50 minutes. Let's just make that an aerobic monster. And that's what you're really doing. But here's the beauty. You never change the neural component to your fast or slow fibers. You're born with either big neurons that go into, innervate, go into those fiber, into those uh, fibers, okay? Or it's a small neuron or a medium-sized neuron. What's a neuron? It looks like a bulb, like a plant bulb. You know, you plant, put plants into the ground and you put, push the soil around and you water it and then it eventually grows. That's what a neuron looks like. It's got a skinny portion coming from the nervous system and then has a bulb at the end and it goes into that um, a set of, set of um, muscle fibers. Usually it's a big set, like your vastus lateralis on the outside of your thigh. There'll be 900 fibers for every one of those nerves, the neuron, okay? Right, your eye has fast twitch, but only has a small number of fibers for each one of the nerves, the neurons, okay? But you never changed you never change the size or the type of neuron that you have. If you're born a fast twitcher, you always are a fast twitcher. But you can change the machinery and the enzymes and everything so that you can process right, the fuel that's available to, to make yourself either really explosive and fast for a short period of time 
or be able to carry on for a long time, but you still got that power. So that's why the best track runners in the world over 10 K 10,000 meters, 5,000 meters, right? They actually have a fairly high percentage of fast fibers, but through optimal training for many weeks, many months where they don't hammer, but they dial it back a little bit and run it controlled. They change those fast explosive fibers into aerobic monsters. So they actually have power in their stride and they have the machinery to be able to use the oxygen. Brilliant. You take a Saeed Awita back in the day. Yes. Okay. He was tested. He was like 54% fat, 54, uh, 54 fast twitch fibers. Okay. That's not much different than in most 800 meter runners. Mm. They're identical. Right. Hussein Bolt is like 65% fast. 35% slow. The average male is 55% untrained, 55% fast twitch, 45% slow twitch. The long distance specialist, the marathoner who doesn't have great sprint, sprint speed, typically is 80 or 90% slow twitch. Okay. So why is it that somebody like Saeed Awita, who has 54% fast twitch, much like a standard person who has, who has good sprinting ability, can run great 5,000 meters. He actually ran in one 10,000 meters in rain and ran like 2620. Mm. Okay? I mean, 2720, which at the time was not far off the world record. Right? That's because he developed a huge amount of aerobic ability in his fast intermediate muscle fibers. He didn't have a VO2 max that was way, way, way higher than any other elite guy at the time. He had an 82, which was, which is high by, you know, normal standards, but it's not unusual among the elite guys, not at all unusual. So why was he able to run a lot faster? Well, some people thought, well, it was drugs and all that. No, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I buy it that he did the right type of training to advance his aerobic ability of his faster and immediate muscle fibers. And he didn't run much mileage. He only ran 50 to 60 miles a week. Mm -hmm. Okay. But he did a lot of interval work that was dialed into what was making him capable of holding his speed longer. It's um, it's a fascinating topic. And I'll, before we move on, look, I could talk about this all day because it's exciting for, for all human beings. Like There's 7 billion of us on the earth. And to be able to, people like Coach uh, Swartz and other people that have really delved into this research over the last three decades. But to be able to, um, I guess, change from the inside out our bodies is something that's fascinated me since my early childhood and how can we change ourselves to make ourselves better versions of ourselves from a, a physiological perspective, especially how do how can we improve and how can we dial the paces down and how can we turn the screws on our own ability intelligently um, and of course, patiently playing the long game. And this is just the absolute perfect way to do it for, for any runner or any endurance athlete. As you've said, you, you often go to other sports and, and point towards other sports. But just on that topic of, um, of Saeed, someone like, do you think a, a Zatapak inadvertently was doing some of this stuff? Because he's obviously famous for his ridiculous workouts. But I've always, I, I've, I find that I think some of those 100 400s like many of those paces might have been cv type paces is that i've just thought of that over the over the journey what's your take on that well yeah you're absolutely right first of all most most people thought that he was doing huge loads of fast 400s and he was not mm. he was actually doing his 400s at, at, very early in his career at six minutes per mile pace yep okay you know 115 per 400 not that fast Okay, it was a big amount, a large amount of confusion about that. You know, you have to understand he was in for, former Soviet Union days and he couldn't go run on the streets. He had to run on the track and do all his training on the track. Mm. Now, can you imagine trying to, he knew that he had to run long distance to build his endurance. But you can, can you imagine trying to run, you know, 90 minutes every day or two hours on the track at the same pace? That would drive you crazy, right? Mm. Lap after lap. I'm sure he just tried to innovate and said, look, maybe I'll run some fast, some slow, some inner. But then he probably learned in a hurry that he couldn't run them too fast or he couldn't keep going. Yeah. And he probably had the priority 
you know, of building his endurance, of keep going, right? He probably had the priority of being able to say run 25 kilometers. So he's like, well, if I run, I run four laps or five laps or six laps to warm up, then I'll run one lap at a medium speed, and then I'll run one lap slow. And so on and so on. And then he, and he experimented over and over and over again. He was doing a lot of, of CV type training. You were mm. right. Another one who was doing that was Jim Ryan, mm. the famous miler from the 60s into the early 70s. Dr. Jack Daniels and I have talked about this occasionally when we've been together and at clinics or something. And he and Joe Veal and I will go out to dinner and boy, do we get into some good discussion. Hang on, that's a great trifecta, that one. I might oh have to duck over dates for. I want to be at that dinner table. Oh my gosh. You know, and, and I like to put myself right between the two greats, the two yeah. legends. Yeah. But you know, what's funny is each of them, especially Dr. Joe V, um, you know, likes to hear my opinion. Um, but which makes me feel great, you know, they're legends in the sport, but, but they're the types of guys that are scientific based. And so they're like, you got to get, they were just like Dr. Phil Leston, mm -hmm. you know, that I had from university. He's like, good idea is a good idea. And I don't care if you're six years old and you have a good idea uh, and you present it, it's, it's still valid. Uh, you don't have to be 70 years old to have a good idea. But um, where were we going? I forget. Oh, I no, no, I, brilliant. You were, you were saying uh, Jim Ryan and Jack Daniels. Oh, Jim Ryan's another one. Yeah, exactly. He was doing CV threshold type stuff, right? So his coach, Bob Timmons, was really a swimming coach, just like Dr. Jack, Jack Daniels was. Right. Jack knew Bob Timmons, the coach of Jim Ryan, because they were they had rival swim teams. Right. One was in Oklahoma uh, and one was in uh, Kansas. So they would compete against each other teams that could be competing against each other in swimming. And um, so uh, Jim got to know. I'm sorry. Jack got to know um, Jim quite well in, in, in the late 1960s, prior to the 68 Olympics. And he would go over um, Jim Ryan's logs, as I understand Jack. And he'd say, wow, Jim, in the wintertime, you're doing nine miles worth of 800s, a half mile repeats in 218, you know, in Kansas wind and cold in the winter, probably in a warm weather, you know, that's more like 415 pace on the track or something, or for, uh, I'm sorry, 215 or two. 12 maybe on the track and in good weather and spikes. And Jack's doing the, he's like, yeah, he's doing tons of threshold running. Now remember threshold is nothing but in my view, um, not quite a, as good a version of CV, but it works the same fast and immediate muscle fibers. I call it stamina training because anything from basically about 75 to 90% of your VO2 max or roughly um, marathon pace for those who run marathons in two and a half hours uh, down to their 30 minute pace, you know, uh, well trained people at that range is all stamina training, all activates your fast intermediate muscle fibers. It's a great it's just, Yeah. So if you're running half mile race pace, you run shorter repetitions, like three or four minute repeats, maybe five at the very most. If you run an hour race pace, well, you probably should run in the neighborhood five or six or seven minute repeats. And if you start running continuously at, at a pace you can hold for a couple hours, um, you don't. You could either do really long repetitions like three or five, three miles or five k reps, or just run it continuously because at that point, a rest break doesn't really reduce your fatigue much. Brilliant, right? brilliant. Yep. Right. But anyway, long story short is some of our um, some of our greats from the past in our sport were doing CV or threshold type training. They just didn't call it that. Mm. And they very often were doing it as early season training, right? Early season training because they wanted to get into high intensity goal pace or race pace type training later. That's a nice but little it, – sorry, Mike, you got to keep going. I'm sorry, but what I would like to point out is some of the guys that were doing 10 uh, races in, in the 1970s and into the 80s, particularly the, the individuals like Bill Rogers and Frank Shorter and, and, and their ilk, um, were racing quite often to make a living, right? So there was no official money, but it was money under the table. Mm -hmm. 
okay, they had to race a lot. You know, if you look at Bill Rogers or uh, in particular, his profile, I mean, he, I don't know, he probably ran 35 races a year. He did. He came out to Melbourne a few times, Billy. Yeah, he ran uh, He ran down there a marathon in like 212, you know, yep. that sort of thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what they were doing was um, basically – improving their fast and immediate muscle fibers because they were running the 10K so often or the 15K or stuff like that because that was money for them. But it was a perfect stimulus for activating those type 2A fast and immediate muscle fibers and developing the machinery to make them aerobic monsters.